Hello and welcome to Baiju's IAS. Let's take up the analysis of today's The Hindu newspaper. In today's newspaper, there are at least three articles that are related to the very important topic of air pollution in the Delhi NCR region. Over the last one month, we have been consistently covering this topic and we have discussed all the important concepts and facts that are related to this topic. But still, there are three important articles in today's newspaper that I want you to go through. In this article from page number one, it has been reported that pollution levels in the Delhi NCR region has hit a three-year high and according to the Central Pollution Control Board, the air quality index in a number of parts of the NCR region has crossed the 490 mark. And according to the Suffer Air Quality Monitoring System that has been developed by the Ministry of Earth Sciences, an air quality index of more than 700 has been registered in few parts of the NCR region. The most alarming concern about these numbers is that the air quality index that is being registered currently is many, many times higher than the safe prescribed limit which is in the range of 0 to 50. In fact, According to the World Health Organization, the PM levels should be in the range of 0 to 20 if the air quality has to be considered safe. And even according to the government of India, the prescribed air quality standard is in the range of 0 to 60. But if you look at this data and if you look at this graph, you will notice that the current air quality index in the NCR region is in the range of 250 to 700. This is clearly many times higher than the safe prescribed limit. The current air quality index is clearly 10 to 14 times higher than the safe prescribed limit. According to experts, if you are constantly exposed to this toxic air, then it is the equivalent of smoking anywhere between 30 to 60 cigarettes in a single day. Then the article also refers to a weather modeling system known as SILAM which predicts the dispersal pattern of pollutants. SILAM stands for System for Integrated Modeling of Atmospheric Composition. This is a weather modeling system that has been developed by the meteorological institutions of Finland. According to this weather modeling system, there is a very high concentration of chemical based pollutants in the northern and eastern parts of India currently. And over the next few days, the wind pattern in the region will be such that these pollutants will be dispersed and they will be transported over the Bay of Bengal and they will be further brought inland towards Tamil Nadu and as well as towards other southern states of India. This prediction of the Silam system is quite alarming because it indicates the possibility of transport of pollutants over large distances under the influence of wind currents. But these claims have been countered by the Indian Meteorological Department. The IMD has said that such transport of pollutants over large distances is highly unlikely. Because according to the weather modeling systems developed by the IMD, the pollutants that are currently accumulated over the northern and eastern parts of India, they are likely to be dispersed by wind currents but it is unlikely to be transported to southern parts of India. The next important point to understand is that the problem of air pollution in Delhi is no longer localized. This problem has interstate connections and this problem is having a national impact and a global impact. So considering the magnitude of the situation, the union government has been directly involved in monitoring the pollution levels and in initiating emergency measures. The cabinet secretary of the government of India, who is the highest ranking civil servant, has been directly monitoring the developments and even the principal secretary to the prime minister, who heads the prime minister's office, has been directly involved in monitoring the situation. These senior officials of the union government are trying to coordinate with other senior officials of the government of Delhi, Punjab, Haryana and other neighboring states in order to contain and manage the situation. Next, this article will also help us understand 
that air pollution and smog not only has a severe impact on human health, but it can also disrupt transportation and connectivity services. When smog and haze conditions increase, and when the air quality deteriorates to such alarming levels, it can drastically reduce visibility in the region. And this can directly affect transportation and connectivity. Because with reduced visibility, the movement of vehicles by road will be severely affected due to the risk of accidents and reduced visibility will also severely affect the movement of trains, flights, etc. Next, we have an article on page number 1 which refers to the odd-even scheme. See, the odd-even scheme is a vehicle rationing scheme which is implemented as an emergency measure in order to curb pollution from vehicles. Under this scheme, vehicles with odd and even registration numbers, they will be allowed on the roads on alternate days. So this emergency measure is expected to bring down the vehicle density and air pollution caused by vehicles in the Delhi NCR region. This emergency measure is being implemented as a part of the Graded Response Action Plan and it will be in place from the 4th of November till the 14th of November. These restrictions will be implemented between 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. with the exception of Sundays. Apart from this, the authorities have also provided for a few exemptions. The odd-even scheme will not apply in the case of medical emergencies. It will not apply for vehicles which are driven by women. This condition will apply only if the woman is accompanied by children who are under the age of 12 years. The restrictions of the odd-even scheme will also not apply for those vehicles that are carrying physically disabled people and it will not apply for two-wheelers as well. But the success of this scheme is entirely dependent upon enforcement and public awareness. So that's the reason why the Delhi government is looking to strictly enforce these restrictions and it has already doubled the fine to 4,000 rupees. And the Delhi government has also invested heavily in spreading greater awareness about the benefits of the scheme. Next, we have an article on page number 6 which refers to strict action being initiated by the Punjab government against those farmers who continue to practice stubble burning despite the ban. See, farmers find it easier and cheaper to burn the stubble that is left behind by the paddy harvest in order to prepare the field for the next wheat cropping season. This large-scale burning of stubble in the Punjab and Haryana region releases huge quantities of smoke and particulate matter which is carried towards the Delhi NCR region by wind currents. This further aggravates the problem of air pollution and smog in the Delhi NCR region and that's the reason why the practice of stubble burning has been banned and the state governments of Punjab and Haryana they are trying to strictly enforce this ban. But in order to ensure that the ban doesn't adversely affect the farmers, the state governments are trying to encourage the farmers to adopt mechanized harvesters and it has provided subsidies to either buy or rent combined harvesters. The advantage of mechanized harvesters such as combined harvesters is that it cuts the standing paddy crop very close to the ground and hence it leaves behind very little stubble in the ground. And the state governments have mandated the farmers to remove this remaining stubble by implementing the super straw management system which makes use of another mechanized farming equipment known as the happy cedar. Farmers in these states have been mandated by the state governments to attach the happy cedar to the combined harvester. What the happy cedar does is, it sows the next wheat crop by completely removing the remaining paddy stubble. So implementing the super straw management system has been made mandatory for the farmers of Punjab and Haryana and those who are found to be violating these guidelines they are booked by the governments 
and heavy penalties are imposed against these farmers. So the state governments are working with the center to strictly enforce the ban and the implementation of the super straw management system. But the problem for the state governments is that they are not able to sustain the subsidies that they are providing for mechanized farming equipment. So in this regard, the states are seeking additional compensation and assistance from the center. Next, we have two articles related to the ongoing Naga peace process. We have an article on page number 1 and 12 and we also have a column on the editorial page. But before we look at these articles, let us get a quick look at the history of Naga insurgency. See, the Nagas are an ethnic group who are found not just in Nagaland, but they are also found in parts of today's Manipur, Assam, Arunachal Pradesh, and as well as in parts of neighboring Myanmar. If you have to understand the history of their conflict with the government of India, and if you have to trace the history of Naga insurgency, then you need to go back to the First World War. See, during the First World War, the British government decided to make use of the war fighting skills of the Nagas. The Nagas are well known for their jungle warfare and guerrilla warfare skills. And the British government decided to utilize these skills of the Nagas and it deployed them in Europe during the First World War. So the experience of the Nagas in the European battlefield during the First World War provided them exposure to new political ideologies and political thoughts. This wartime knowledge helped the Nagas to organize themselves politically in order to preserve and protect their distinct ethnic and political identity. In order to fulfill this purpose, few members of the Nagas, they came together and they set up an organization known as the Naga Club. Most of the members of the Naga Club were those who had fought on behalf of the British during the First World War. Through the Naga Club, they started to mobilize political opinion in order to protect their distinct ethnic and political identity. They even submitted a memorandum to the Simon Commission which visited India in 1929. Through this memorandum, the Naga Club had appealed to the British government to treat the Naga inhabited areas as a separate political entity from the rest of mainland India. So the Nagas felt that they had no common interests with the rest of India and they believed that their language, their culture and their ethnic identity would be under threat if they were to merge with a Hindu dominated nation. So as the freedom struggle gained momentum, and as India was about to become independent, members of the Nagas, they kept appealing to the British government to treat the Naga inhabited areas as a separate entity from that of the rest of mainland India. In order to further this demand, the Naga club was transformed to the Naga National Council or the NNC and now its members had received modern guerrilla warfare training by the British during the Second World War. So in order to fulfill some of these political demands of the Naga National Council, the British government proposed the Akbar Hyderi Agreement. This agreement was signed in 1947 and under this agreement, limited autonomy was provided to the Nagas within the ambit of the Indian constitution. But this arrangement was not acceptable to the NNC because their demand was to establish a separate independent state known as Nagalim, which would bring together all the Naga inhabited areas in the northeast of India. Since their demands were not met, and since they were only provided with partial autonomy within the ambit of the Indian constitution, it decided to reject the Akbar Hyderi Agreement and it declared independence on the 14th of August of 1947. So even before India could become independent, the roots of Naga insurgency had been sown. So as soon as India became independent, the Naga inhabited areas 
were included as a part of India, that is, as a part of Assam, Northeast Frontier Agency, etc. And this was not acceptable to the NNC. The NNC had already declared independence and hence they declared an insurgent war against the government of India. So since then, the Naga insurgency has lasted for more than 70 years. And it was not only the first insurgent movement that independent India had to deal with, but it has also been the longest standing insurgent movement in India. So in order to counter the Naga insurgency, the government of India started deploying the Indian Army and its paramilitary forces and it gave them special powers by enacting the Armed Forces Special Powers Act or AFSPA in 1958. So the period between the 1950s and the 1970s was a very violent period in the Naga inhabited areas. But along with this conflict, the government was also trying to initiate peace efforts. As a part of these peace efforts, the Indian government decided to carve out the state of Nagaland from Assam and grant statehood to Nagaland in 1963. Even though Nagaland was set up as a separate state with special constitutional protection under Article 371A, it was not sufficient to win over the Naga rebels and hence the insurgent movement continued into the 1970s and 1980s. During this period, the Naga rebels were able to establish a strong base in neighboring East Pakistan, that is later Bangladesh, and as well as in neighboring Myanmar. They enjoyed support from governments which were hostile to India, and they even enjoyed the covert support of countries such as Pakistan and China. But the liberation of Bangladesh in 1971 came as a major blow to the Naga rebels and this forced them to sign a peace accord with the government of India which was known as the Shillong Accord of 1975. But the Shillong Accord also ended up as a failure just like the Nine Point Agreement or the Akbar Haidari Agreement because the Shillong Accord was accepted only by the moderate factions of the NNC. The radical elements of NNC, they rejected the Shillong Accord and they went on to set up one of the most notorious insurgent and terror outfits of the Northeast, which is the NSCN or the National Socialist Council of Nagaland, which was set up in 1980 by using Myanmar as a base. Till date, the NSCN and its factions is still considered as one of the most dangerous insurgent and terror outfits in the Northeast. And this period of insurgency, that is between 1950s and 1980s, which was led by the Nagas, became a source of inspiration for numerous other insurgent movements to break out in the Northeast. Between 1980 and 2010, the NSCN and its factions have caused a lot of violence in the region. Their main target has always been the Indian security forces. But over a period of time, the NSCN has split into numerous factions. This split has occurred mainly because of ideological differences between their leaders. The two main factions of the NSCN today are the NSCN IM or the Isaac Muiva faction and NSCN K or the NSCN Kaplang faction. These two factions of the NSCN had been sufficiently weakened in the 1990s due to effective counter-insurgency operations. So as a result, the Indian government could push both the factions to sign a ceasefire agreement in 97 and 2001 respectively. But despite signing the ceasefire agreements, these two outfits, they continued to operate and they continued to cause violence and terrorism in the region. Later in 2011, there was one more faction which was born. It's known as the Kole Kitovi faction. So like this, there are numerous factions of the NSCN which have posed a grave threat to India's national security and territorial integrity. The key demand of the NSCN and its factions is to bring together all the Naga inhabited areas and establish an independent state known as Naga Lim or Greater Nagaland. This includes the Naga inhabited areas of not just Nagaland but as well as parts of Assam, parts of Arunachal, 
parts of Manipur and as well as parts of Myanmar. But post-2010, India started to gain an upper hand with regard to Naga insurgency because of the emergence of friendly governments in neighbouring Bangladesh and Myanmar. Thanks to their assistance in counter-insurgency operations and in sharing of intelligence, India managed to crack down on both the Isaac Moiva faction and as well as on the Kaplang faction. The top leaders of the Isaac Moiva faction were arrested and as a result, this outfit agreed to negotiate with the government of India and a framework agreement was signed in 2015 in order to initiate the Naga peace process. But the Kaplang faction has managed to evade arrest and it has set up a strong base in Myanmar reportedly with the support of Chinese intelligence services. So the NSCN Kaplang faction has broken the ceasefire agreement and it continues to remain in a state of war with the government of India and it continues to lead an insurgent war against India. So as a result, the NSCN Kaplang faction is not a part of the ongoing Naga peace process. The ongoing Naga peace process is between the government of India, NSCN Isaac Muiva faction and a number of other Naga political groups which have come together under an umbrella organization known as the Naga National Political Groups. So the ongoing peace talks are between these stakeholders. The government of India is represented by its interlocutor, Mr. R. N. Ravi. R. N. Ravi is a senior officer who has retired from the Intelligence Bureau. Right now, he has been appointed as the governor of Nagaland in order to lead the peace process. He has been negotiating with the NSCN IM, which has surrendered to the Indian government, and he is also negotiating with various Naga political groups that have come under this coalition outfit. So the only breakaway faction is the NSCN Kaplang, which continues to remain in a state of war and it has continued to carry out major terror attacks, especially against the Indian Army. One such attack took place in 2015, which pushed India to carry out surgical strikes inside Myanmar. See, this ongoing Naga peace process should have been concluded by the 31st of October and a permanent peace accord was supposed to be signed between the Indian government and these factions of the Naga rebels. But according to reports, a final peace agreement could not be worked out because of the emergence of key differences between the government of India and NSCN IM. The Isaac Muiva faction has been insisting for a separate constitution and a separate flag within the ambit of the Indian constitution. But this demand is unacceptable to the government of India because it would be similar to what Jammu and Kashmir had under Article 370. Now that the government has revoked the special status of JNK under Article 370, it is in no position to extend the same privilege and autonomy that has been demanded by NSCN IM. So due to these differences, the Naga peace process could not be concluded by the deadline that was 31st of October. But luckily, the Naga peace process has not fallen apart, it has not been cancelled, and the parties have not walked out of the peace process. This peace process is going to continue until these differences are resolved, which will help in the signing of a permanent peace accord. In this article, it has been reported that political representatives from Manipur have demanded an assurance from the centre that the ongoing Naga peace process should not affect the territorial integrity of Manipur. And they have demanded that the peace accord should bring an end to the practice of extortions and illegal taxes that were imposed by Naga insurgents against the people of Manipur. So in order to understand how Manipur is related to the Naga peace process, we need to look at the map of the state. See, Manipur is bound by Nagaland to the north and in the hill areas of Manipur that are present over here, the Naga tribes are dominant. The Nagas who reside in the hilly areas of Manipur that is over here, they have very close connections with the NSCN and other insurgent groups of Nagas. 
they share a long history of enmity and rivalry with the Metis, who are the dominant tribe in Manipur and who can be found in the valleys of Manipur. See, the objective of the Naga insurgents is to establish Nagalim or Greater Nagaland, which would unite all the Naga inhabited areas. This would include the hilly areas of Manipur as well. So the demand to establish Nagalim would violate the territorial integrity of the state of Manipur. So naturally, this demand has been resisted by the Metis. The Metis not only have a long history of enmity and rivalry with the Nagas, but they also have a direct conflict with the demands of the Naga insurgents. So due to this inter-tribal rivalry, the Nagas have capitalized upon a geographical disadvantage of Manipur, which in turn has imposed a significant cost on the state. See, the only connection between Manipur and the rest of India is through two national highways. One national highway runs through Assam and another national highway runs through Nagaland. The disadvantage of Manipur is that both the critical highways run through Naga-dominated areas in the hills of Manipur. So the Naga insurgents have capitalized upon this geographical disadvantage of Manipur and they have frequently imposed a blockade on these highways, which in turn has crippled the state by creating critical shortages of essential items. Apart from this, the Naga insurgents have collected illegal tolls from the traders who are using these highways and they have even imposed illegal taxes on vehicles that are passing through these highways. So this is how the Naga insurgency has affected the interests of Manipur. That's the reason why political representatives from the state have approached the central government and they have sought an assurance that the Naga Peace Accord should not affect the territory of Manipur and it should bring an end to the illegal act of imposing blockades and taxes and carrying out extortions. Finally, in the column, the writer blames the NSCN IM for the current deadlock in the negotiations. The writer blames the NSCN IM for adopting an idealist approach during the peace process and he is calling upon the insurgent outfit to recognize the realities of today by giving up the aspirational demands of the 1940s. See, it is high time that the NSCN IM recognizes that the dream to establish a greater Nagalim as an independent state is no longer feasible. Neither the rebels have the capacity and the resources to prolong the conflict, nor is it in the interest of the Naga people. Instead, NSCN IM should recognize the realities of today and by keeping in mind the good interests of the Naga people, it should give up its aspirational demand of a greater Nagalim. It is high time it stops demanding a separate constitution and a separate flag and instead it should settle for a territorial council for the Naga areas and greater constitutional protection. Such autonomy and flexibility would be more than sufficient to help the Nagas to preserve their unique culture and identity. So if the NSCN IM is truly interested in the well-being of the Naga inhabited areas, then it should give up its age-old aspirations which are not rooted in reality and it needs to accept the current situation. So the writer says that the NSCN IM should stop acting as the villain of peace and instead it should facilitate the peace process. Now let's take up the next article. The Ministry of Home Affairs and the Intelligence Agencies they have warned about a possible lone wolf terror attack by operatives of the Islamic State. So in this context, we need to understand what is lone wolf terrorism. See, a lone wolf attack refers to individual acts of terrorism that is carried out by self-motivated and self-radicalized individuals. These individuals would have only subscribed to the ideology of a terror organization. They will not be a part of the command structure of the terror outfit. They would not have officially joined the organization and they would not have received 
any direct or material support from the terror group to carry out the terror attack. Instead, they are self-motivated, they would have subscribed themselves to the ideology, they are self-radicalized and they are acting on behalf of the terror organization. So in the name of this ideology, if an individual carries out a terror attack on behalf of the terror group without being a part of its command structure or without receiving any support from the terror group, then such an attack is referred to as a lone wolf attack. Of late, such lone wolf attacks have increased significantly with the rise of the ideology of the Islamic State. We have seen a number of such attacks taking place in Paris and many other European cities and as well as in the United States. These attacks were carried out by individuals who were motivated by the ideology of ISIS and they did not have any direct connections with the terror outfit. Another example would be the recent Christchurch attacks wherein innocent Muslims were targeted by a radical supremacist. Even the Easter Sunday attacks in Sri Lanka can be taken as an example because even though the attacks in Sri Lanka were carried out by a group and not an individual, it still closely falls under the definition of a lone wolf attack because the group of individuals who carried out the Easter Sunday attack, they were self-motivated and self-radicalized. They did not have any direct connections with ISIS and its command structure. They had not received any direct material support from ISIS. These lone wolf attacks are not just limited to the ideology of Islamic State. They have also been carried out by those individuals who have subscribed to other far-right ideologies such as the neo-Nazis, supremacists, etc. The biggest challenge with such lone wolf attacks is that they are harder to track and prevent for the security and intelligence agencies. Because an individual or a small group which is operating on its own is much more harder to track because they are not well organized. A known terror organization is much more easier to track because their communication and their funds are already under surveillance. But when you have just one individual or a small group who are operating on their own, it becomes all the more difficult for the intelligence and security agencies to track them and prevent such kind of attacks. Another challenge with such individual acts of terrorism is that they need not rely upon sophisticated weapons such as bombs, guns, etc. They can turn day-to-day -day objects into a simplistic weapon. We have seen numerous incidents, especially in Europe, where ISIS sympathizers have turned a bus or a knife or a truck into a weapon. They have managed to kill dozens of innocent people by using such simplistic weapons and this is what makes it difficult to track and prevent such lone wolf attacks. Now let's take up the next article. 500 passenger trains have been fitted with ISRO enabled GPS. The article says that around 500 passenger locomotives of the South Central Railway have been fitted with the real-time train information system which has been built on the Gagan system of ISRO. Gagan stands for Global Positioning System Aided Geo-Augmented Navigation. This is a GPS-enabled system that has been developed by ISRO. The Gagan series of satellites that have been launched by ISRO, they are providing for precise geo-augmented information which can help in navigation services. This can provide precise information for railways, air traffic, etc. So the real-time train information system that has been installed on passenger trains has been built on the Gagan system of ISRO and it provides for precise speed, location and movement of trains. This information can help improve the efficiency of operating these trains and as well as its safety. It can help identify any mechanical breakdowns. It can help identify any unscheduled stoppages which might occur because of theft on the train and any such information can be easily conveyed to the customers in order to improve their user experience. Now let's take up an article from page number 9. The Indian Army 
to have the first Danush regiment by March 2020. See, recently, we had a discussion on the heavy artillery guns of the Indian Army. During this discussion, we spoke about the imported heavy artillery guns of the Indian Army. This includes Bofors from Sweden, the M777 from the United States, and the K9 Vajra or the K9 Thunder from South Korea. During the same discussion, we also spoke about Danush. Danush is the first indigenous heavy artillery gun that is being developed in India. It is being currently built by the Ordnance Factory Board. And the first regiment of Danush heavy artillery guns will be inducted into the Indian Army from March 2020 onwards. And also remember that the Danush is an upgraded variant of the Swedish Bofors gun. The Danush comes with an extended range of more than 36 kilometers. It comes with advanced features such as inertial navigation system, GPS-based gun recording, thermal imaging, laser range finder, etc. Now let's take up the next article. ISRO's NAVIC set to be commercialized by Antrix. See, NAVIC stands for Navigation in Indian Constellation. It is a part of India's IRNSS project. It stands for Indian Regional Navigation Satellite System. This is a constellation of satellites that has been developed and launched by ISRO in order to provide for precise positioning information and real-time navigation. The IRNSS or NAVIC is considered as the GPS equivalent of India. Just like the US has the GPS, India has developed the NAVIC or the IRNSS. Under the GPS or the Global Positioning System, the United States has built a constellation of more than 36 satellites which provide for global coverage. But the IRNSS or NAVIC provides only for regional coverage. Because this project of ISRO includes a constellation of around 7 to 11 satellites which provides a coverage of around 1500 kilometers in radius around the Indian subcontinent. Currently, around 7 satellites have already been placed in orbit by ISRO and a few other satellites are on standby to meet any emergency situations. This constellation of satellites, they can provide for accurate navigation and positioning information which can be very useful for both military applications and as well as for civilian applications. The satellites that are a part of NAVIC have already been made available for military applications and now ISRO is looking to provide for civilian applications through NAVIC by commercializing the technology by using its commercial wing that is the Antrix Corporation. Now let's take up the practice questions. Dust click is the code name of a joint military exercise that India holds with Uzbekistan. Option C is the right answer. This question has been asked because we have a related article on page number 13. India's Defence Minister Rajnath Singh has paid an important visit to Uzbekistan. During this visit, three defence deals have been signed between the two countries which will enhance cooperation in military medicine, education and training. Along with these agreements, the Defence Minister has inaugurated the first ever joint military exercise between India and Uzbekistan. The codename of this exercise is Dustlek, and the main focus of this joint exercise is counter-terrorism. Apart from this, India has extended a line of credit of around $40 million to Uzbekistan. Now let's take up the second question. Apart from the American GPS, India relies on which other positioning system for its military applications? See, Galileo is a global positioning system that has been developed by the European Space Agency. Similarly, GLONASS belongs to Russia and Beidou belongs to China. See, initially, India was dependent on the American GPS for positioning and navigational information for its military applications. But considering how unreliable the United States can be in a warlike situation, India started shifting its dependency to the GLONASS positioning system of Russia. 
So option B is the correct answer. Now let us take up the third question. Consider the following statements. The cabinet secretary is considered as the highest ranking civil servant in India. The cabinet secretary is the ex officio head of the civil services board, the cabinet secretariat, the Indian administrative service and all other civil services under the rules of business of the government. Both the statements are correct because we discussed earlier that the cabinet secretary is the highest ranking civil servant of India. So option C is the right answer. Now let us take up a map based question. Along the India Bangladesh border, which of the following can be seen as challenges to border management? See amongst the given four options, the challenges to border management along the India Bangladesh border would be the presence of a riverine terrain, the presence of mangrove forests and the presence of illegal migration and pumping in of fake Indian currency notes. Because if you look at the India Bangladesh border, there are two major river systems which are found along the border. We have the Ganga and the Brahmaputra, two of the largest river systems which are transboundary rivers. So this creates a riverine terrain which makes it extremely difficult to patrol and manage the international border. The same applies for mangrove forests as well because along the Indo-Bangladesh border you will find a lot of mangrove forests. The example is the Sundarban. And the third option is also correct because illegal migration and the pumping of fake Indian currency notes is very rampant along the Indo-Bangladesh border. But piracy is not reported along this border. So 1, 2, 3 are correct. Option C is the right answer. Now let us take up a practice question from the 2019 prelims paper. In India, the use of carbofurin, methylparathion, forate, trisophos is viewed with apprehension. These chemicals are used as pesticides in agriculture. Option A is the correct answer. Finally, let's take up a couple of mains practice questions. The first question, how does severe smog conditions affect urban life? The second question, the Naga insurgency is a remnant of India's colonial past. Discuss. Kindly write an answer to these questions and post them in the comment section below. So this concludes our discussion for the day. Thanks for watching.